You know, one of the hardest things that a pastor has to do every week is to try and find new meaning and relevance to a passage that is oftentimes quite familiar to his or her congregation. And today's lesson is one of those instances. You know, I know throughout the years, for anyone who has grown up in church, you have heard more sermons about the prodigal son or the lost coin or the lost sheep, or probably more than any other passage in the New Testament. Because over the years, preachers have tried all kinds of approaches to unpack all the riches that lie in those 32 verses. I recently read where one pastor did a whole 16-week sermon just on the prodigal son. And after the 16th sermon, this little old lady came up to the pastor and she said to him, I am so sorry that boy ever ran away from home. <laughs> <coughs> like a lot of passages that we hear on Sundays, perhaps this story of the prodigal son or the lost coin or the lost sheep has become just a bit too familiar to us. I think the struggle we have in hearing these old stories is trying to find something new in them, trying to find something that means something to our lives. I think it's like trying to hear something we've never heard before. What we're all looking for today is some good news for our lives right here and right now. Just from a pastoral point of view, the messages that I come up with and bring to you each week are intended to renew us. They're intended to reawaken that new creation that is within us. But you know, that can only happen when the words cease to be ink on a page and become written on our hearts. And I think that happens when we allow ourselves to enter the story and we understand that scripture is meant to make a difference in our lives, to change us. You know, we don't want to be changed too often. We were talking in Sunday school about how all too often we take God off the throne and we put ourselves on the throne so that the whole world revolves around us. And we don't like change. Even when we come to salvation, we find ourselves still keeping a tight hold on that throne. We just think we're forgiven for doing it. In preparing for today's lesson, I began to think about the two sets of characters that Jesus was speaking to, and it reminded me of a movie from several years back, quite a few years back, actually. If you saw the movie Goodwill Hunting, You'll remember the story was about a young man who lived in Massachusetts. He was a minimum wage janitor working at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I remember it mostly because he was played by Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> but here was this man working as a janitor at a college. He was a young man going nowhere in his life. And all the while, he was surrounded by the brightest and best in the world. But the ironic twist came in the movie when one of the college professors had left an extremely complex mathematical equation on the, bullet, on the blackboard, yes, they still used blackboards back then, <laughs> and he left it as a challenge for his students to solve, and the janitor walked in and wrote out the answer. In that film, we saw Will Hunting, who was a prodigal, 
surrounded by prodigies. And as the film went on, we saw a prodigal become transformed as he came to understand who he was and what he was going to do with his life. So with a slight change in the title, I came to understand that our story today could be called, instead of the prodigal son, God's Will Hunting. Amazingly enough, if we look in the dictionary and we look up the word prodigy, and we look up the word prodigal, they are very close. They follow very close proximity in Webster's. Interestingly enough, they both begin with prod, a push, a poke, a shove. The difference is one is pushed to be extraordinary and exceptional, while the other is pushed away from whatever is good for his life and is wasting their potential. The beauty of scripture, in my opinion, is that if we're going to take it seriously, and I hope that everyone here this morning does, the beauty of that scripture is that it's not just words on a page, but each time we open it, we are invited into that story. If it's going to be relevant for us today, we must find ourselves invited into the story. I think we're missing the point if we don't put ourselves in the picture. And if we don't, then the Bible simply becomes another book gathering dust on the shelf, no matter how many times we read it. So this morning, we have been invited into a room with Jesus. We've been invited into a room with Jesus. You see, today we are no longer just onlookers. We're not holding the Bible out to here. We are getting into the story with Jesus. No longer do we have the safety boundaries of saying, that's them and this is us. Because this morning, Jesus is right here in the room with us. And we're here in the room with everyone that he was talking to that day. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke tells of three times that Jesus was invited to a Pharisee's house. And each time, that meeting took an unexpected turn for the host. The first time, Luke tells us that Jesus bypassed the ritual washing of his hands before sitting down to eat. And of course, the Pharisees were aghast that he had given up on this Hebrew tradition this ritual that was so important to them because he was no longer pure and he was not able to eat with them. But instead of apologizing, Jesus declared six woes upon those Pharisees that were with him that day. And he condemned them for being impure, telling them that a mere water was not going to take the impurities that they had away. The second time he's invited to a gathering at a Pharisee's house, he's sitting there and a woman walks in and she lets her hair down and she's crying. And she washes his feet with her tears and then she takes a very expensive jar of perfume and pours it upon his feet, wipes them with her hair, and then kisses his feet. And then the host is rebuked. So this morning we find Jesus once again at the home of a prominent Pharisee. <clears throat> Do you think it's going to end well? Because Jesus came, but he invited a few guests to join him. He invited some sinners, some tax collectors, some prostitutes, some ne'er-do-wells, some people that they have Pharisees just didn't like very much because they knew how much better they were than them. So Jesus came to dinner 
bringing his own guest list with him. So here the Pharisees were having the sanctity of their meal turned upside down. You know, if we're careful to read the New Testament, Jesus tells story after story that's filled with prodigies and prodigals. It's just we never really, really take notice of it until we get to the 15th chapter of Luke, where we have the story of the prodigal son. Scripture is littered with prodigals. Scripture is filled with prodigies. So this morning, here we are. We're sitting in a room full of prodigies. And we're sitting in a room full of prodigals. Prodigies, let's just call them Pharisees this morning, okay? These are people who have it all together. They know what's going on. So let's have the prodigies on this side of the room. Over here we have the prodigals. People who have squandered their inheritance are sitting outside of favor. Now the prodigies are not necessarily bad people. You know, we give the Pharisees a pretty bad rap, but they're simply living into the calling that they've been given. They're doing what they think is right, and they're living by the law of Moses. But you know, they follow that law so well that their ability to see the rest of the world and its problems becomes diminished. They get so wrapped up in their calling that they don't see the real world going on around them. You might even say they're blind. Not necessarily bad, just blind. And of course, then we have the other side of the room with its prodigals. And you know, every prodigal that's in the room could come up with a story about how they got off into that faraway land. How they got in the car one day and drove to Atlanta and spent the next two years in Atlanta until they ran out of money. Each of us has a story of a faraway land that we found ourselves in at some point in time in our lives. But they haven't come to swap stories. They've come to hear a young Nazarene by the name of Jesus. They've been hearing these rumblings about grace and love <coughs> and what God wants to do with people's lives. And they follow Jesus into this meal because they're not ready to let go of that promise yet. They're not ready to go to the law of Moses and give up this promise of grace and mercy and love that this Nazarene has been talking about. And it happens. There's some mumbling and grumbling from the prodigy side of the room. And a remark is overheard. Just look at that Jesus. Is it not bad enough that we have to share the same room together? But he has to go sit down at the table, eat and laugh with them, and totally ignore us. Doesn't he know that prodigies and prodigals are a world apart? How dare he snub us and sit with them? So here we are in this room, and I ask us, which side of the room are we on? Are we prodigals or prodigies? You know, there's not a one of us in this room that has been, not been given a gift of some sort. Something that we were either blessed with or inherited or taught. Something that was placed into our hands and our hearts for some reason. And I ask, what have we done with it? Have we done something with it or are we wasting it and letting it go? 
inside. 